Hello, my name is Laura Morreale and I'm a co-editor of Middle Ages for Educators. I'm here with Professor Magda Teeter, the Schwidler Chair in Judaic Studies at Fordham University, who has kindly agreed to speak with me about her recent work on Simon of Trent uh, and how the story of this young boy was used to weaponize anti-Jewish sentiment in late medieval Europe. We'll be pairing Professor Teeter's discussion with a consideration of the anti-Asian and anti-Asian American racism that has resulted in many tragic episodes throughout American history, and most specifically in the shooting deaths of six women of Asian descent in March, 2021 in Atlanta, Georgia. We think the idea of the perpetual foreigner will be a fruitful framework for understanding such disturbing events. But we'll begin first by learning about Professor Teeter's work. And I'll just begin by asking you if you could tell us a little bit about the case of Simon of Trent. Uh, thank you so much, Laura, for inviting me. Um, the case of Simon of Trent is very interesting. It's a case of a uh, on the borderline between the me medieval ages, Middle Ages, and uh, the early modern period, where uh, culture, technology, and uh, Europe changes uh, quite dramatically. And, but it it grows out of medieval uh, tales. So it's a story of a of a boy who disappeared um, just uh, around it, actually the time we're discussing where we are recording it on March 24th, 5th, uh, 2021 and he disappeared on the uh, Monday uh, Thursday, which was, I think, um, March uh, 22nd of 1475. So we're exactly speaking at the time when the events were happening in a, what is now northern Italian uh, town of Trento. Uh, at the time, it was um, it was in the political sphere of the Holy Roman Empire, um, and it was truly culturally and politically a borderland. Um, the town was inhabited by uh, by German um, uh, speaking people, including Jews who were German speaking and the Italian speakers. Uh, it was a, you know a, a, not a melting pot, but a, but a, a town of two, where two different cultures existed. So, uh, in that um, time uh, of Easter Passover. Um, this boy disappeared. Simon Simon was about 28 months uh, old, a toddler. Uh, he disappeared. Uh, when he disappeared, people thought he may have just wandered off when he didn't return in the evening and uh, and the father and, and some neighbors were searching, couldn't find him. They figured he must have drowned. Uh, Trento had many canals uh, near its Adige River, so it's not inconceivable. And it was quite a common experience in Europe uh, when uh, children would wander off and especially in the spring often would drown when snow was melting. Not an inconceivable happening. But what happened was uh, and uh, on some rumors started circulating that perhaps Jews had had killed Simon. This was a story um, accusations against Jews killing Christian children um, emerged in 12th century uh, England and then um, spread across the also the continent in the 13th century. So these these stories were circulating, were known largely locally, but but they they existed. Um, and uh, on Saturday uh, that week. Um, the uh, authorities searched the Jewish homes. They found nothing. But on Easter Sunday, the uh, body washed up um, and in a canal underneath one of the J uh, Jews' house, houses. So when Jews found the body, they actually found the body of the boy, they immediately notified the authorities who came in and identified the body as Simon. And um, and the local bishop um, immediately uh, took initiative and figured that there was also uh, some benefit for him and for town. 1475 was a jubilee year. There were pilgrims uh, going to Rome during that year. It was a, a perfect opportunity for the bishop to have a reason for these pilgrims to stop in Trento. 
Um, so Jews were arrested, the men of the of the community. It was a tiny Jewish community, about three houses um, on in the in the in, the, in town. Um, the men were arrested. Uh, women ended up in a house arrest, but not in prison. And just days after the arrest, a full narrative before the trial even fully began. It began, but not fully. Not everybody was yet, yet interrogated. Um, the uh, narrative was set. And this narrative said that Jews captured, uh, plotted to capture Simon uh, in order to kill him in derision of Christ and reenactment of his passion over Easter Passover and in order to collect his blood. Um, and and, and Simon, therefore, was a, a martyr, a, a beatus to be worshipped. Uh, his body was immediately taken to a church, and the, the bishop began to promote it as a, as a pilgrimage site, recording, uh, recording uh, alleged miracles as well. When I examined the trial record, and they are collected, in a way that they are uh, organized according to the names of people who were tried, uh, not chronologically. Um, but when I read them chronologically, it became very clear that the, uh, the story is actually quite consistent at the beginning. And then later on, they are increasingly pressured to confess to things that they clearly didn't do to um, even verbatim to align with the narrative that was written down and published just a few days after uh, after Simon's body was 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 found but the records are organized in such a way that uh, you think that Jews are shifty because some deny some not some say one thing at the beginning then the story changes because obviously if you organize it by person who was uh, interrogated a few times over a few months um, and in different pressures that story might in, in fact change and uh, again align. So it, 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 was a, it was a very conscious process of both creating archival and material and record um, on the part of the bishop and the authorities and, um, and uh, frame it as a, as, a, as a Jewish crime against Christian to create this a site of veneration. Um, again, this is an, a largely medieval story, but what becomes, uh, what, what happens in Trento and why it becomes so important is that it comes about 20 years after the invention of the printing press. This bishop understands its power and he pays and sponsors visual art uh, for churches. Uh, he sponsors uh, printed images, um, woodcuts. He sponsors the narrative, as I said. He pays uh, poets to write poems in Latin and in the vernacular and songs. So he, what is very crucial to understand this case, that he really engages in a full multimedia, perhaps the first in history, multimedia campaign public relations campaign to convince the world around him that this, this Jews killed Simon and therefore he is a martyr worthy uh, to visit uh, in, in Trento. The, the Pope objects to it. The Popes, in fact, had objected to such accusations uh, since the, uh, the 13th century. Um, and uh, and sends his uh, investigator um, uh, to see what was what was happening in, in Trento, um, and um, and the investigator concludes that this is you know a fake story, but his materials are suppressed, and the bishop has enough um, enough political power across in Rome where he lived for and, and worked for many years and. Uh, and elsewhere, that he is able to suppress the uh, the records, court records, and uh, also the, the court records that were uh, that were verified by the by the papal envoy. And what we only have are the court records that are prepared by the bishop in in terms of the historical record that's left. Um, 
So the bishop makes sure that that story enters printed books, that it enters printed chronicles of the history of the world. And what we see is that exact shift from medieval stories that were local, that may have been written down in local monastic chronicles, to a story that becomes, spreads like wildfire through print, through image, and establishes both um, facts on the ground in art and churches, for instance, but also establishes facts in histories, right? So he creates the historical fact of Jews killing Christian children that enters the um, ecosystem of European knowledge. And when you look at those chronicles, this is not something, you don't need to look for anti-Jewish literature. You can be just an, a person who wants to learn history. And when you begin to read these histories, there are about maybe a dozen of stories included about Jews. And they're all nasty stories about Jews as killers, Jews as um, uh, Jews, uh, sac uh, committing sacrilege, Jews desecrating, uh, you know, Christian objects, things like that, for which they are usually punished. The, the, the solution in these stories is that always that Jews are uh, punished. So, um, so if you are a reader in, uh, in Christian, of Christian uh, European books, and you only see Jews in these roles, uh, so you begin to see Jews as only doing nasty things and being punished for them. So the vocabulary about Jews for a, a reading person, for an educated person, becomes very limited because they only begin to see and talk about Jews in a certain voc uh, 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 limited way. Uh, the people who didn't read books, who lived next to Jews as neighbors, didn't have those ideas. It was the educated elites that perpetuated this way of thinking about Jews. And ironically, we historians, when you look at what history, uh, European um, history, history of medieval Europe, whenever historians write about Jews, they always repeat the same vocabulary. Jews were expelled from France. Jews were accused of that. They are really replicating the language that was established by these both medieval and then early modern chronicles. And that is something that I would like to flag for historians and students of history to be careful not to replicate the language because it has a mounting effect of then enacting these things. Because that's the only thing you can imagine about a given group, um, group's role in society. So if you can only think about Jews as being dangerous, if you can only think about Jews as being dangerous and therefore needing to be punished, you begin to see Jews as dangerous. And that applies to any other group. The other th story, the other thing that this, this story presents as a cautionary tale is um, the way it, 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 its imagery uh, disseminated. So one of the things that you will see in many, and it's both in academic books and in anti-Semitic website, is a certain image from um, a chronicle from 1493 uh, uh, published in Nuremberg, so the so-called Nuremberg Chronicle. It's all over, both, again, scholarly works and, and uh, anti-Semitic works. Scholars have used this image very uncritically to uh, illustrate this anti-Jewish accusation. But this image was actually historically quite marginal. It, it, it was not remembered at all. There was a different type of iconography that spread um, and was replicated, especially in Northern Europe. But it became resurrected by the Nazis, who were very eager to look at pre-modern, medieval, and early modern sources and past to either create their idea of what German history was, or to vilify Jews in their anti-Semitic propaganda. So one of the things that I would 
think about students of history and scholars of, of history to think about how our sources enter the circulation, whether they are visual sources or textual sources, whether they were in fact important at the time that they were created or soon after, or maybe they enter circulation because we are, you know, we, we are excited about it. And that's a similar story with, a med with the medieval tale of William of Norwich that was written down in the 12th century in England. It disappeared from circulation, from circulation, from knowledge. There were these, you know, wine liner chronicles or short, uh, short mentions here and there. But the manuscript was discovered in the 19th century, and it became suddenly became one of the major medieval accusations, medieval stories. So again, we have to think about the the way. Um, facts or stories or tales or sources enter circulation. How does this historical example from medieval Europe help us understand the rules of inclusion and exclusion in societies and um, what might make certain groups um, viewed as perpetual foreigners in their own homelands? That's, a, that's a, a fantastic question. And I think this example and these tales included in, in Chronicles show how an, something unusual, something sensational can shape perception of otherness, uh, intellectual perception of, of otherness. But when you go into archival records, when you look deeply into historical records, not just the headlines, right? When you think about chronicles, they are the equivalent of the sensational headlines of our media. They don't record the usual, the daily, the boring. They, rec re they record something that is unusual, but they shape the way we think about, uh, about people or about situations. But in fact, Jews were not considered foreign. They were obviously different. They went to synagogue and not a church. They did not um, uh, celebrate Easter. They celebrated Passover. Everybody knew that they were of different religion. And of course, there was this baggage of Christian Jewish difference and Christian attitudes and, and Christian theology um, uh, in the way Jews were seen. But the neighbors didn't necessarily act on that difference unless there was a moment of crisis or that could be then these stories could be weaponized against against Jews. But what we began to think about is we, we use either um, legislation uh, seeking to separate Jews from Christians uh, or these antagonistic or anti-Jewish stories to uh, paint Jews as perpetually foreign. And I think that is also the danger of leading to um, deepening prejudice rather than seeing Jews, in, in our case, we're discussing Jews as part of the shared history and part of the shared environment, uh, and acknowledge that sometimes the, the difference was weaponized and sometimes it, it was not, someone was just taken for granted. Yeah, and then of course that leads to my my third and final question. Um, you know, after looking at this historical example of Simon of Trent, um, I'm sure that you have a better sense about why such seemingly you know senseless acts of of blaming innocent actors occurs and recurs in our in our history. And I think you've spoken a little bit to that. Um, but you know, I think there's always a sense of of asking why. Um, everyone in our society just starts to say, well, what you know, why is this? Why would this happen? Um, and I, I think you've touched on that some of those, but did you want to elaborate on any of that? I, I will. I will just say that once these stories uh, uh, perpetuate through the mass media, uh, they begin to influence also law, and they begin to influence also uh, criminal justice, if you will, whatever what 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 the system was in the in the pre modern world. And what happens is that these uh, ways of thinking and the last the stories of the past are being used as evidence of Jews' guilt and in, in, in future uh, future accusations. And you can see a very similar way of thinking in um, in uh, the United States as well. 
um, whether in, for instance, um, recently there was a, a case in New York where a white woman called the police uh, on a uh, in Central Park on a black man um, a, who was a bird watcher, accusing him of of endangering her, uh, slanderously accusing her of endangering. This is a deeply ingrained trope of the dangerous black male uh, endangering a. a you know, a, a white woman that goes historically very deeply. If we examine whether anti-black stereotypes or whether anti-Asian stereotypes in contemporary uh, United States, if you think about the way these tropes are perpetrated and per uh, perpetuated, sorry, perpetuated by um, by constant repetition or visual images, or you know, what think about what uh, what roles do uh, African American or Asian actors get in films, for instance, that creates a certain ways of thinking about a, a, a given group, and that then otherizes them in ways that you know you may you may have neighbors and you might have uh, friendly relations on the ground, but culturally it creates ways of thinking. So, so this story of Simon of Trent is a, a cautionary tale in a sense that uh, it shows us the mechanism of how certain stereotypes and even fake news, fake stories, get embedded in culture and thinking about a group of people.